Hey guys, Jim here. Welcome in once again. The internet is full of damn dirty liars. Everywhere you turn, everywhere you look, you don't know who you can trust, who you should be listening to. And as a result, this is a knife that I believe that a lot of people slept on because they believed the bullshit that a lot of people were saying that probably really didn't know what they were talking about to begin with. And I don't mean knife reviewers on YouTube. Although some of the things that we're going to talk about here, a few knife tubers have actually said, but they did try to explain why they had that opinion. But I've seen this knife discussed uh, in a lot of different Facebook groups all over the internet by a lot of different people. People asking, hey, I saw this knife. I thought it looked really great. What do you guys think about it? And the first thing that people talk about is it is insanely overpriced. It's overhyped. It's not worth it. It's a bunch of bullshit. And yeah, it is a bunch of bullshit. The, the crap that they were spewing is a bunch of bullshit. The problem is when you're just conversing with somebody on Facebook, in most cases, you don't know what their experience level is. If they've only ever owned Spydercos and Cold Steels and Kershaws and their upper budget has always been $75, Sure, a knife that's over $100 is probably going to be to them, in their, to use their words, overpriced. Because they don't understand what overpriced means. They just think anything that's expensive is overpriced. Just because I can't afford something doesn't make it overpriced. I can look at a Bentley and go, shit, that's amazing. I wouldn't say it's overpriced. I just know I can't afford $350,000 for a car. But I can rationalize why it's worth that much with the materials and the workmanship and the way they build their cars. And I've explained this in great detail in the past. Expensive doesn't mean overpriced. And those of you that are veterans of my channel that have gone back years and years and years with me, you know that I brought out knives here that were thousands of dollars per knife. So... In the case of this knife, it's hard to really call it expensive. When I've come out here with knives and shown you knives that I have owned, that I have had makers make for me, that were $3,000, $4,000, $5,000, dollars I could justify that expense because I knew it's worth. The maker was worth it. The workmanship, the materials, all of that together was worth it. It is hard to justify several hundred dollars on any production knife for most people because you're not getting a handmade custom. You're buying into a mass-produced knife that comes off an assembly line and at best will be QC'd by hand to make sure things are in, in proper working order. What I'm talking about, of course, is the James Brand Barnes. This is a knife that I've been curious about for over a year since it first came out. A lot of people on YouTube have talked about it, and most of them have given it a fair shake. They've gone, yes, the $540 that you'll pay with their long-running 10% off discount, it is a lot of money for a production folder. And they've been able to justify most of that expense because of the fact that it is a solid titanium integral. And it does take a lot of expense to make an integral knife. It is very, very expensive. Basically, any mistake made making this frame, all of that titanium and all of the machine work that had gone into making it up to that point goes into the garbage can. So there's a high waste rate, high waste expense rate. I wouldn't want to take that on, that's for damn sure. If this were a custom knife, this would easily be $2,500 plus. No way around it. 
Is it the GOAT? Is it the greatest of all time? Well, that's really up to you to decide. I'm not going to say that. But what I will say is this is one of the best knives that's currently available that you don't have to... You don't have to run yourself ragged to get like, you know, let's say you're in the market for something really exclusive like uh, an Oz machine company, Roosevelt. That's that's more expensive and the secondary market is far more expensive and it's difficult to pry one out of somebody's hands. This, you can go right to the James Brand website or to any of their dealers and buy it right now. Now, if you buy it direct, the full retail price on this is 600 bucks. Yes, that is a lot of money for a titanium folder. Not going to argue that. What I will argue is the fact that people don't, they don't think before they speak. I try to be somewhat calculated with the things that I say. And you have to keep in mind that there's more that goes into the cost of a knife or the, the retail price of a knife than just the cost of materials. There is also the expense of the machine time because you're running that machine, you're running that CNC, you're paying that person, the machinist, to run that CNC, and it all goes by the hour. Actually, it can be broken down to the minute how long it takes to do all the things that they did to make this knife. You have to factor in the design costs. You have to factor in the marketing costs for a lot of these big companies. For somebody like me, I'm a handmade knife maker. I make one knife at a time. I don't have huge marketing expenses, but I understand what that's like. I've seen it from every angle. There are some brands out there that spend more in their marketing than they do in their manufacturing, whether it be knives or cars, motorcycles, boats, apparel. That's honestly the way it is in a lot of cases. The James brand is, is a unique thing. And if you start looking at it for what it really is, I think it's a little bit easier to understand. You're sitting at home as a knife collector, possibly a longtime knife collector, going, I don't want some marketing company coming out here with a bunch of hype telling me that I need to own their knives to fit into this lifestyle because that's not who I am and that's not how I want to be represented. I get that. This is a brand that if you look at it like craft beer or like those craft hamburger places, you'll easily spend twice as much on a glass of beer from a really good microbrewery than you will from this the, the trash that's out there from the macro breweries like Coors and Budweiser and Bush and all that garbage, the, the beer flavored water. Fuck up. Know your fucking place, trash the quality of the product. And a lot of times it's because of the atmosphere that you're in when you're consuming the product. I spent a, a good bit of time in Portland, Oregon, which is where the, the founder of the James brand is. Uh, Ryan is in Portland, Oregon. And while I didn't get along with any of the, the type of people that live there, that's just, we just didn't jive. I'm a very East Coast person. They're very weird people. These are people that keep studded tires on their cars and drive down the highways at 80 miles an hour in the middle of June and then complain next year that there's ruts all over the roads. Then, then take your studded tires off when it's not winter, jackass. Anyway. The point I'm trying to make is there's a, you're, you always pay for a lifestyle. You always pay for an ecosystem. Think of Harley Davidson and Ducati as compared to the Japanese motorcycle brands like Honda, Yamaha, Suzuki. 
you're not paying a premium to get into those Japanese brands. You're only paying for the product. You're not paying for the ecosystem that you're buying into. You're not buying into a lifestyle. With Harley and Ducati, you absolutely are. And it's something that even if you don't like the idea of that, you find comfort in it. You enjoy it when you're doing it. Like, I've never been that kind of person. I always kind of went in the other direction when people talked about that when I first got into motorcycles. I was buying Victory and Suzuki and, and everything except for Harley because like I don't, I don't need a lifestyle around what I'm doing. I'm doing what I'm doing for me. But there's something different about walking into a Yamaha motorcycle dealership and talking to people that are in there and something entirely different when you walk into a Harley dealership and you start talking to the customers that are wandering around in there. They want to know about your bike. They want to compare yours to theirs. They want to tell you about where all the, the best riding places are. The, the guys in the Japanese motorcycle dealerships, the customers, um, they generally just want to talk about how fast their bike is and how they're better than you are or some shit like that or how their body position is, is, is better than yours or some bullshit. And there's always ego at play. And it's a, it's a nice feeling to step into a community that's established itself as being welcoming and I think for the most part, we are as the knife community. And what the James brand is trying to do is take an EDC community feeling, build a lot of different products that drop into that, that ecosystem. It could be knives. It could be any number of things that would, that would qualify as EDC. And the benefit for a brand of that size doing this is they've got the money to spend to contract with some of the best factories to make some of the best products and their aggressive marketing is bringing more and more people into our community and that's always good holy shit not only is the action fantastic but it feels really, really good in the hand. Is it the best thing that's ever been made? No, but it's one of the best EDC knives I think that you're ever going to come across at any price range in a production knife. The closest thing I can compare this to because of the shape of the overall profile and the way that it feels in the hand the closest thing I can compare this to is a Todd Rexford Epicenter. I have reviewed custom Todd Rexfords. I've handled a few other ones. And I can tell you right now, some of the reasons that I fell in love with Todd Rexford's knives, the Singularity, the Epicenter, and some of his other ones, is the way that they feel in the hand. The, the neutral ergonomics, the very simple shape to the frame, and the way it all ties together. It feels substantial without being quote-unquote overbuilt. It's just perfectly designed and perfectly thought out. And that's something where I have to give the James brand credit again is the fact that they spent the time designing this the way that they did. Everything is so... I've seen and handled a lot of integral knives and I've never seen any that were rounded, that were crowned in quite the same way. All the way down to the butt, all the way across the spine of the frame, Everything is rounded. It, it almost looks like a like some hipster's USB vape stick. If that was just laying on a table and a non-knife person walked in, they'd probably assume that that's what it was. 
Am I going to keep the lanyard on here? I'm not entirely certain, but I really dig the way they designed the lanyard attachment. This is unlike anything that we've really seen before. The way that the clip attaches, I've never personally handled a knife where the clip attaches to the body in the exact same way. Because what they're doing is they're sliding it into place and they're locking it in with hardware from the inside going straight into the frame that keeps the clip in place. Another design aspect that we're probably going to explore a lot is the, where the pocket clip lands. That landing pad is completely smooth with no texture. So this isn't going to be tearing up your pants pocket as you're pulling the knife out and pushing it back in. It's going to have a nice smooth area for it to slide up against. Very Everything on this knife was well, well, well thought out. And they went to Riot for the manufacturing because Riot can make a perfect knife. A lot of people want to talk about the action of a knife and how drop shutty it is. For me, sure, I like to have a smooth, fast action, but smooth is my favorite part. And this is a controlled drop shut. You've heard me say over the years, almost a hydraulic feel. It's very smooth, but it's not frictionless. It's not like opening and closing a winter blade factor, which I thought I had one sitting over here, where it just drops completely. It's not going to guillotine your thumb if you don't get your thumb out of the way from unlocking it quick enough. It's very much, it's very much like a Rockstead shin, where it has that incredible smoothness but it's not trying to slam itself shut. I like this thing a lot. This very well may end up being my pick for production knife of the year at the end of this year. It is that well thought out. It is that well executed. The blade profile is perfect. The edge is fantastic. The, the action is awesome. The feel in the hand is really, really, really good. I can't find any serious flaw with this knife. And all of the really honest YouTube knife reviewers have gone out here and talked about, yes, it's expensive, but yes, the quality is really high. And they've tried to temper your expectations if you were looking at buying one. Because none of us ever want to get that message where it's, hey, you were hyping this up so much, I thought it was going to be the greatest thing ever made. And then I bought it and I got it and it let me down in any number of ways. That's the worst thing as a reviewer that we can hear. We always want you guys to know that you can trust what we're saying and... We try to mix the good in with the bad. Yes, yeah, $600 is a lot of money for any production knife. But the people that say that are also the same people that have never bought a Rockstead, have never bought a Shirogorov, that have never spent five, six, seven hundred dollars $700 on a production knife. Anytime they've ever spent that much money, it's always been a custom. And it makes them feel better, I guess, to say, well, I spent that much money, but it's a custom. And that's great. You're putting, you're putting that money into that man's pockets to support his family because you paid for an amount of time out of his life that he put into that build for you. That's great. But to say that no production knife is worth that much, that's almost impossible to say these days. And again, I always go back to Rockstead for that because Rockstead is, is and will always be, for me, where the bar is set for a high-end luxury production knife, period. And they're more semi-custom than production. I mean, all the parts are mass-manufactured, yes, but everything's fitted by hand. The blades are 
sharpened by hand. Uh, so much of it is done by hand that it's kind of hard just to call it a production knife. Riot has this down to a science. You can give them a good design and they will execute it to a degree that almost nobody else will. For a lot of people, I've seen them say, well, if this was made in the USA, I could justify that price. All right, you're, you're saying you can justify the price on a production knife, but only, be, only if it was made here. So that still means that a production knife can absolutely be validated at that price. Now, it's easy to keep saying $600 because that, that's the retail on this knife. But again, as I mentioned, if you're buying off their website, oh, excuse me, they almost always have a discount code running for 10% off. That brings you down to $540. That's a big deal. And if you are an emergency responder or law enforcement, you get a, an even more substantial discount. I think it was something like 30%. I know hinderers used to be 30%. And it reminded me of that, so that must have been why. So anyway, it's a substantial discount if you are law enforcement or emergency responder. All right, this is going on way too long to be just an intro. Let's get into the photography. Let's get into the music. And let's make our way into the review. Fucking goat outside. It's just a goat. No, it's a fucking goat.
Okay, here we go. And I got to tell you, I could not be more excited right now. As a matter of fact, this is the second time I'm recording this because as I was going through it the first time, I realized that I was coming off sounding really negative and that's not what I want to portray here. Negative toward all the people that just couldn't stop running their mouths about cost and worth and hype and all that kind of shit. It's definitely an important part of the discussion because unfortunately, as people get into certain hobbies, they trust the community that they're stepping into to help them find their way through. So when you hop onto a Facebook group dedicated to knife collecting and you say, Hey, I found this awesome new knife that I think I want to get and I need some feedback on it. And all the feedback comes in from people that really don't know what they're talking about and they have no experience with what they're trying to comment on. It's a bad look and it's frustrating to look from the outside and see that and go, man, here's somebody that's, that's going to be wildly misled. Because I could see long before this ever arrived that it was a fantastic knife, that there was almost no reason to not fall in love with it. And that is what's happened. I have truly fallen in love with this knife. It gives you a unique feeling when you're playing with it, when you've got it in your hand. There are a shit ton of great designs out there, and this one really matches up well with some classic designs that have been around for a long time that everybody loves. And they're universally loved. It's one of those kind of designs where you could put it in a hundred people's hands and you're going to get very similar responses about how much they love it and maybe for a hundred different reasons. And that, my friends, is what the TLDW is all about. I'm going to give you very quick bullet-pointed pros and cons on the knife as quickly as I can. I'm going to try not to belabor each individual point, which is very difficult for me to do. Because when you find certain things that you're picking out, whether it be positive or negative, you tend to want to justify those with an explanation and or make comparisons to other products that either do a better job at that thing or fall short at that thing. So it's a little challenging sometimes for me to do this segment. TLDW, too long, didn't watch. For those with short attention spans that cannot sit through the entire length of the video to hear about all the highs and lows of the knives that I'm reviewing. And we'll start with the pros. First pro for me, a point that I'm just going to probably keep driving home, is the ergos. The feel in the hand, the feel when you're using the knife. Neutral and extremely comfortable. That rounded butt, the rounded frame spine. All that adds up to something pretty unique, pretty different. Typically, when you're looking at a titanium frame lock, even if, it, even if it is contoured a little bit, like this, you're still going to have a defined line around the outer perimeter. And that's not a bad thing. It's just, that's just the way it is. This, you don't have that. You have a wonderful softness as the backside transitions over to the front and back-facing sides. 
It's a beautiful transition. And it's not so rounded that you feel like the knife is going to twist and torque in your hand when you're using it. And I still say this is the closest to satisfy my obsession for a Todd Rexford knife that I've ever held. We all had pretty high hopes eight, nine years ago when Todd Rexford had commissioned his design to be made into a production knife with Boker. But it was a tragic mess. It was hot garbage, as with most Boker knives. They did a terrible, terrible job on that knife. And it was very disappointing. And I think anybody that ever got their hands on one went, why are people spending ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 for the custom version of this knife? Do they not know what quality is? Do they not know what ergonomics are? Do they not understand the basic Role, the basic role of a knife, it just wasn't executed well. Here you've got a kick-ass design that, because they trusted Riot with it, was executed very, very well. So the biggest pro for me is how it feels. The ergos, the way they designed all these rounded corners... Another pro for me is the understated elegance of this colorway, the dark gray of the titanium, the brightness of the hand rub satin flats and the vapor blasted bevels, along with that pop of neon green color. I just think it's awesome. It adds a little bit of personality to a knife that is somewhat plain and basic in its finished colors because they do make a pretty awesome black DLC frame and with the black when you look inside there's like a rainbow of colors that goes down in the spine I'm not really sure what that's from but it sure as hell looks cool this I thought was subtle it was understated. It had that classic steel and titanium look, which I am a huge fan of. And it added just a touch of personality, but it's not obnoxious. So overall, the visuals on this knife... It is wonderfully aesthetically pleasing. And I love the texture in that milling. That milled pattern is awesome. It's a lot of detail. It took a lot of time to mill. And it wasn't wasted. It not only looks great, but it feels great. And that takes us over to the next pro, which is that smooth landing pad where there is no milling. For the pocket clips, so when the, the knife is clipped in your pocket, when you're sliding it in and out, and this is pushing the fabric down against the body of the knife, the fabric isn't getting torn up on this raised pattern. If they didn't do that, your pockets would be thrashed in probably the first month of carrying this knife. So good on them for not just going, hey, we've got a cool looking pattern we're going to put in this. Let's do it all over the knife, regardless of how practical it may be. They held themselves back and went, let's make the knife functional as the priority. Because I can't tell you how many knives I've gotten in my pocket in the past couple of years where the design of the knife was gorgeous, the action, the lockup. The everything was just done right, 
and then it was a son of a bitch to get in or out of the pocket to the point where you're going to step out for the day and go, eh, I, I want to carry this knife, but I don't want to carry this knife. And you end up in this weird little dilemma where you're kind of arguing with yourself when you need to get your ass out the door. And then you realize just how stupid it is to sit there and argue with, you, with yourself about the knife that you wanted to carry that day. We've all been there. It's stupid as shit. You know, it's just like having multiple cars in the garage. You have in your head, oh, that's the one I want to drive for whatever reason. Then you're like, well, that's not going to be practical for what I'm doing today. This is, this is really not the best choice. And then you argue back and forth with yourself which set of keys you're going to take. It's stupid. You feel stupid while you're doing it. And you feel stupid when you reflect back upon it later in the day. So for me, I don't give a shit how great a knife looks. If it won't carry well, it's not staying in my collection, period. This knife carries very, very well. Another pro is the unique pivot that's in this knife. When you think of any standard pivot, it's going to be three pieces. It's going to be this pivot head and this pivot head, both screwing in opposition into a threaded pivot barrel. And that barrel is what's running through the titanium and through the blade, holding the blade in place. And then you're just applying pressure to keep everything closed by screwing it down together. This isn't like that. Imagine this pivot, okay? If you drilled and tapped a hole right here to screw another pivot head into, because that's exactly what it is. So you've got your pivot, the barrels going all the way through the titanium, all the way through the blade. And on the back side is screwed another pivot head. And inside of that pivot head is a threaded hole to accept this pivot head because that's screwed down through that to hold this pivot island in place. Boom. Unique concept for sure. And very, very cool. I argued with myself for a while. I, I guess I'm kind of revealing some, some screwed up mental issues. Um, I argued with myself for a while whether I was going to sit out here and I was going to take this knife apart on camera or not just to show that to you. I think I'm able to get the point across just by describing it. We'll see. So that's how they hold that pivot island in place. So they pivot goes in, they screw the pivot head down, and then this pivot head is screwed into the other pivot head. It's just that simple. All right, another thing that I like is the extra touch of the enamel-filled markings. This is extra time, and time is money. They could have just very simply engraved this, left it like it was, and it would have been totally fine. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. Or just done a simple laser etch logo, and that's it. Instead, they chose to give it contrast. They filled it with enamel, cleaned it off, and left the engravings filled with the enamel. Very classy, very nicely done. The only thing that I really enjoy is the, uh, the way this pivot is done. The way it's stepped down into that concave. And the way that the clip is mounted. So this one big solid piece of titanium was milled out in a fashion where you can slide the clip in. And then the hardware goes in and they screw it down. And that's what holds the clip in place. Brilliant. Really, really slick the way they did that. It's an extra step, not only in design, but also in manufacturing that most people probably wouldn't have justified the expense on. They would have gone, you know what, I'll just find some other more normal way to attach a pocket clip. I don't really need to do crazy shit like that. But it's crazy shit like that that's going to set this knife apart from every other design out there. 
And if that helps you justify in your mind the price that you're paying for this, go for it. That is, that's certainly something that I would throw in there and go, yeah, that's uh, that's part of that's part of the expense of making this knife. Absolutely. Just thinking what a son of a bitch that had to be in the CAD renderings to submit to Riyadh so that it was easily understood how they were holding that clip in place and what that hardware was for. The raised diamond pattern on this feels so good and looks so good. Okay, now let's get into cons. Are there any cons? No, not really. Judging this knife on its own merits, the way that it feels, the way it was designed, the performance that I've gotten out of it already, I have absolutely no complaints. This is absolutely one of those knives that is as close to being perfect as you can reasonably expect. And that's a big thing to say, man. Holy hell, that's a really big thing to say. I'm not what one that's much for hype and just throwing out buzzwords and shit like that or just putting out unquantifiable descriptors like, perfect, this knife is perfect. Is it perfect? No, but it's as close to perfect as we can reasonably expect for the money spent. Now, if this was $1,000, I think I might be expecting a little bit more out of it. I'm not really sure what, but I think I'd want a little bit more out of it if it was twice the price. But as it sits, it's everything that I was hoping and praying that it would be. I had already gotten feedback from a few people about how much they liked it. I watched Lefty's video. I watched MC's videos. And I absorbed the, the, the details of what they were trying to, to convey. The, the feeling they had for the knife. How they liked it. The things they did and didn't like. And I think it met all of my expectations. I've waited a year to get this in my hands. Because when I first became interested in it was when everybody else was getting theirs. And I saw it and went, that's pretty friggin' nice. And I didn't act on it. And I should have. So yeah, I'm late to the game on this and I am totally fine with that. So here's the part where we just talk about the specs. What are we looking at here? Titanium integral frame lock, overall length of 7.8 inches. Blade length of 3.5 inches. It is M390. Weight is 4.6 ounces. So it's a hefty girl. Yeah, yeah. That's a fat bottom girl right there. She's not fat, she's big boned. And she feels really good. Now, diving a little bit deeper into my personal thoughts on the knife, the things that I really love, and why I would suggest to everybody watching to find one for yourself, even if you're not buying one, Get one in your hand, experience the knife, and get a feel for it, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. You're going to pick it up, and it's going to feel like a natural extension of your hand. The action is going to surprise you with how wonderful it feels. When I was talking in the intro about actions that are crazy drop-free, 
This is a great example, the, uh, the winter blade factor. Some people don't like when they release the lock that the blade begins to drop immediately and without friction whatsoever. They like something a little bit more controlled. This is every bit as smooth. It just feels like it's gliding instead of falling out of control. I like both of these actions equally and for completely different reasons. I think my Chavez is pretty drop free too. Once you've released, once you've gotten past the detent, it just falls. Plus you've got a pretty thick, heavy blade here too. So this is one that if you weren't paying attention, you could very easily cut yourself when that blade drops. You're disengaging the lock and you didn't realize, oops, I gave it too hard of a tap on the spine and it started closing too fast before I got my thumb out of the way. You're waiting for me to lob off the end of my thumb right now, aren't you? That, by the way, is a great way to kill your thumbnail. The weight of that blade and the sharp corner there at the heel of the edge, where that thing can hit you, it could actually crack right through your thumbnail. Now, with the Barnes, never have to worry about that because it's a much more controlled closing. But everybody likes different kinds of actions for different reasons. Like I said, I like having both of those in my collection at the same time. Some that are completely drop free, some that are a little bit more controlled. There's a little bit more friction involved. I think the Barnes is one of the best options for a collector that also really likes using their knives. If you only collect just to have a huge collection of beautiful knives to look at, you'll certainly enjoy looking at it. If you like what you see in the video here, then I'm, I'm sure that you're going to like it just as much in person. But if some of the enjoyment that you get is actually cutting shit with it, fidgeting with the action, opening and closing it, then this is definitely going to be one of the big winners in your collection. It's another reason why I love the, the 229, because it's, it's a great design, but it's very clearly designed off of something that was made to be a work knife. And when you go to use this knife, that's exactly what this blade and these grinds are for. 
it is meant for hard use. So you get extra satisfaction. You get the satisfaction of having a really wonderfully operating, good-looking knife that will also perform the given tasks. And that's why this one has been in my collection for so long. Because it absolutely does everything I want it to do. It's a beautiful design, great combination of materials. I know I can never rust it. It's got a fantastic action. I don't know why all of a sudden I, I turned all country there. And it cuts like a mother. And it holds that edge for a damn good long time. So it did everything. It checked all the boxes. It did everything I wanted it to do. And it's been a keeper. And that's exactly what this is. It's going to do everything that I want it to do. There's no reason that I would ever expect it to let me down. And it's a damn sharp looking knife too. Oh yeah. So there you have it, boys. That's my thoughts on the James Brand Barnes. I hope you guys enjoyed it. This is definitely one you want to get in your hands and feel for yourself. Get together with some of your knife collecting buddies. Hopefully one of them has it and you get a chance to, to fiddle with it and fondle it, hold it and play with it and get a, a good feel for what the knife really is. And I think you're going to be very, very pleasantly surprised. All right, that's it for me. I'll see you guys on the next video.